Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video in this series, we introduced quadrature rules that allow us to numerically integrate functions over a given interval. Here, we're going to generalize this idea to composite quadrature rules, where we would break down a large interval into several subsections that we could apply our quadrature rule to. We'll take a look at some of the issues surrounding this, such as how we can calculate error bounds for composite quadrature, and we'll look at a numerical example. If we integrate a piecewise polynomial in Turpeland, then we get what we refer to as a composite quadrature rule. And suppose we divide our interval from A to B into m equally spaced subintervals. So in that case, the subinterval width will be given by h that's equal to b minus a divided by m. And we can also define xi that's equal to a plus i times h to be the position of the ith boundary between subintervals. So therefore we can have that i of f is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and we can break that out into the sum from i equal 1 to m of the integral from xi minus 1 to xi of f of x dx. And we could now apply our quadrature rule to each one of those component integrals. So let's take a look specifically at the case of the composite trapezoid rule. So here we'll apply the trapezoid rule to each interval, and we'll approximate the integral from xi minus 1 to xi of f of x dx as h divided by 2 times f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi. And we can write down our composite trapezoid rule as q subscript 1 comma h of f, and that will be equal to the sum from i equal 1 to m of h over 2 times f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi. And in this sum, a number of terms will combine together, and we'll end up with h times samples of our function from f of x0 up to f of xm, and the two values at the ends of the interval, x0 and xm, will have a half weighting, and all of the terms in between will have a weighting of 1. Let's now look at the composite trapezoid rule error analysis, and we'll define e1, h of f to be equal to i of f minus q1, h of f, and we can write that as the sum from i equal 1 to m of the integral from xi minus 1 to xi of f of x dx minus h over 2 times f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi. And we can bound this error in terms of the sum of error bounds over all of the constituent subintervals. So the magnitude of e1, h of f is less than or equal to the sum from i equal 1 to m of the magnitude of the integral from xi minus 1 to xi of f of x dx minus h over 2 of f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi. And we can now apply our bound for that subinterval. So that will be less than or equal to h cubed over 12 of the sum from i equal 1 to m times the maximum of the second derivative over the subinterval. And we can just bound those second derivative terms by the infinity norm of the second derivative over the entire interval. And we've also got m terms in that sum. So therefore, we can say that our error bound is less than or equal to h cubed divided by 12 times m times the infinity norm of f double prime. And since m times h is equal to b minus a, we can write that then as h squared divided by 12 times b minus a times the infinity norm of f double prime. We can obtain the composite Simpson rule in the same way, and suppose we divide our interval from a to b into 2m intervals by the points xi, defined as a plus i times h, where now h is given by b minus a divided by 2m. So if we apply the Simpson rule to each interval x 2i minus 2 to x 2i for i equal 1 to m, then we end up with our composite Simpson rule q subscript 2 comma h of f 
and that will have a prefactor of h over 3 and then samples of all of our points from x0 up to x2m. The two endpoints will have a weighting of 1 and then all of the interior points will have weightings of 2 and 4 that alternate. Let's now take a look at a code example where we can compare the accuracy of the composite trapezoid rule and the composite Simpson rule. Let's now take a look at the program quadrat.py that can evaluate the errors associated with several composite quadrat rules. And in this program, we'll first define a function f that we're going to integrate. And here, I've defined f just be equal to sine x. And the reason that I chose this simple function is that we know how to integrate it exactly and so therefore we'll have an exact answer that we can compare our quadrature rules to. Now I'm going to define a function called trap that can perform our composite trapezoid rule. It will take in four arguments the function to integrate, the interval range from a to b, and the number of subintervals to use. And the function will first evaluate the step size or the subinterval width h to be equal to just b minus a divided by n and it will then apply the trapezoid formula it will first sample the function at the two endpoints a and b and apply a weighting of a half and it will then loop over all of the interior points in the interval and apply a weighting of one to the function samples it will then return the answer scaled by the subinterval with h. Similarly, we'll also define a function that can evaluate the composite Simpson rule, and it will take in the same four arguments of f, a, b, and n. It will again calculate the step size in terms of b minus a divided by n, and then we will apply Simpson's formula. First, we'll sample the two endpoints with a weighting of 1, and we'll then loop over the interior points and apply the alternating weightings of 4 and 2. And in this loop, there's one point that's actually left over, and we will deal with that separately in this final line here. We'll then return the answer scaled by a factor of h divided by 6. And now we're going to test these two composite quadrature rules by integrating sine over the interval from 1 to 5. And over this interval, we know that the exact answer for the integral will be equal to cosine of 1 minus cosine of 5. And we're now going to calculate the errors for the composite trapezoid and Simpson rules using a variety of different interval sizes. And we'll start using just j equal 1 subintervals, and we'll keep on doubling j until j exceeds 65,536, which is equal to 2 to the 16. And for each j, we'll print out j, the subinterval width that's given by 4 divided by j, and then the errors for the trapezoid and Simpson rules. So let me now run this program. And this program outputs the results to the terminal, and we see the four columns of information. In the first column, we see the number of subintervals that double each time. And in the second column, we see the subinterval widths that halve each time. And in the final two columns, we see the trapezoid and Simpson rule errors. So let me now run this program again, and I'm going to output the results to a temporary file called out. And we'll now take a look at the results in GNU plot. So I'm going to use a log log plot, and on the x-axis, I'm going to plot the subinterval with h and on the y-axis I'm going to plot the integration error. So let me first plot the results for the trapezoid uh, rule and some of the errors that are outputted are actually negative 
and I'm therefore going to plot their absolute values so that they make sense on the log scale. And if we plot the results, then we see that we have a very nice uh, and smooth behavior in our errors. And in this log log plot here, we see that these errors are forming a straight line, which tells us that we have a power law relationship. And if we recall the formula that we derived for the trapezoid rule bound, then we found that it would be less than or equal to the subinterval width h squared divided by 12 times the integration interval length times the infinity norm of the second derivative of our function. And since all of these parts 12, b minus a, and this infinity norm are all constant, the scaling is really governed just by the h squared term. And we therefore hope that the trapezoid errors will scale like h squared. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot uh, h squared on top of this plot. And we can indeed see that the scaling matches. And these two lines have the same gradient which shows that the trapezoid rule errors indeed scale like um, h squared. And if I just adjust the positioning of this straight line, then we can see that we have very good agreement. So now let's look at plotting the Simpson rule errors as well. And one thing that we can actually expect here is that because we're dealing with one additional integration point, then we would expect that the order of accuracy would increase by one. And if we follow through the same arguments that we used to derive the trapezoid rule bound, then we would find a Simpson rule error bound where e2 comma h of f would be less than or equal to h cubed divided by 192 times b minus a times the infinity norm of f triple prime. And so we would therefore expect that we might see h cubed scaling in our plots. So let's now take a look at the Simpson rule data. And as expected, the Simpson rule errors decay more rapidly as h is decreased. And we actually see that beyond around h is equal to 0 0.01, then the Simpson rule errors actually saturate, and that is due to hitting the limit of machine precision. And as expected, machine precision shows up roughly on the scale of 10 to the minus 16, 10 to the minus 15. So now let's try plotting a cubic line on top of this data and see whether we get agreement with this expected cubic scaling. And unfortunately, we see that this is surprisingly not a good match. The gradients here between the light green line and the magenta line are not in very good agreement. And so we might ask, why does this happen? And one thing that we might try here is to perhaps increase the order of this line that we're plotting. So let me now just try fourth order instead. And we actually see here that for the Simpson rule errors, they're a much better match to a fourth order convergence. And this is rather surprising because we really expected to see this h cubed scaling. However, it's actually known that 
the Simpson rule errors indeed scale like h to the 4, even though we only use one more additional quadrature point in the derivation. And the reason for this is that the leading order error term in the Simpson rule actually cancels away due to symmetry. And you can do a more refined calculation and find that this Simpson rule error bound should scale like h to the 4. Now it's worth noting that this formula here that we derive using the same methods as the trapezoid derivation is still accurate and consistent. However, this is only a bound here and in this case it turns out that the actual scaling properties are better than this bound that we've derived and this is a worthwhile thing to keep in mind. This can often be the case where you might derive a bound for some error term but there are possibilities that the error term might actually scale more favorably than the bound that you derived. It's worth noting that composite quadrature rules are very flexible and in particular we don't need to choose our intervals to be equally spaced and intuitively we could choose our intervals for a function f so that they are small in places where f varies rapidly and large in places where f very slowly. And we can actually perform this using an adaptive procedure. So let's let m equal to 1. So we first try integrating with just one interval. And then on each interval that we have, we evaluate our quadrature rule. And we also estimate the error associated with that quadrature rule. Then if the error estimate is bigger than some tolerance, then we can subdivide the interval into two and go back to step two and try again. And that will lead to a recursive subdivision procedure where we'll keep on subdividing our intervals until we reach this required error tolerance level. So the one question we have to ask then is how we can estimate the quadrature error on a particular interval. One straightforward way to estimate the quadrature error on an interval i is to compare to a more refined quadrature calculation on the same interval. And now let's write capital I of f and qh of f to be the exact integral and quadrature result on this interval i respectively. And let's now write q hat h of f to be the result of a more refined quadrature calculation on the same interval. Then if we apply the triangle inequality, we can say that the magnitude of i of f minus qh of f is less than or equal to the magnitude of i of f minus q hat h of f plus the magnitude of q hat h of f minus qh of f. And we can now suppose that the first term on the right hand side, the magnitude of i of f minus q hat h of f can be neglected because if q hat h is a more accurate quadrature calculation, then we can expect that this term will be small in comparison to the second term. And therefore, we can use q hat h of f minus q h of f as a computable estimator for i of f minus q h of f. Python and MATLAB both have functions called quad that can perform adaptive quadrature calculations. And they use slightly different implementations. MATLAB's quad function uses an adaptive Simpson rule. And I'm showing the help text that you can get if you type help quad. So now we have an effective set of methods that we can use for doing composite quadrature rules. And in the next video, we'll look at an alternative approach where we can use unequally spaced points to construct quadrature rules.